Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play The Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, Game of the Year Edition. Once again, it is story time. Fetter's got a lot of reading to catch up on. And some of it is squirreled away in chests in the various guild halls in Balmora. So Fetter's going to head back there by way of Siltstrider. Okay. First stop will be the Fighters Guild. And yeah, Fetter is not at his fastest right now. He's carrying some stuff. But that's okay. Should you need something, I will be happy to oblige. He's still pretty zippy. Okay, first, Confessions of a Skooma Eater. Confessions of a Dunmer Skooma Eater. Nothing is more revolting to Dunmer feeling than the sorry spectacle of another Dunmer enslaved by that derivative moon sugar known as Skooma. And nothing is less appetizing than listening to the pathetic tales of humiliation and degradation associated with a victim of this addictive drug. Why, then, do I force myself upon you with this extended and detailed account of my sins and sorrows? Because I hope that by telling my tale, the hope of redemption from this sorry state shall be more widely known. And because I hope that others who have also fallen into the sorry state of skooma addiction may therefore hear of my story, of how I fell into despair, and how I once again found myself and freed myself from my own self-imposed chains. Because it is widely known to all Khajiit, who may be expected to know, that there is no cure for addiction to skooma, that once a slave to skooma, always a slave to skooma. Because this is widely known, it is taken to be true. But it is not true, and I am living proof. There is no miracle cure. There is no potion to be taken. There is no magical incantation which frees you from the thrill of skooma running through your blood. But it is through the understanding of that thrill, and the acceptance of the lust within oneself for that thrill, and the casting aside of the shame that the thrill-seeker feels when he cannot set aside what becomes, in the end, his only comfort and pleasure. It is through this knowledge and understanding that the victim comes to the place where choices may be made, where despair and hope may be separated. In short, only knowledge and acceptance can deliver into the slave's hands the key that opens his shackles and sets him free. The narrative of Tilsi Sendos's tale carries the reader through the stages of early infatuation, ecstatic obsession, and profound degradation of her addiction, and in the course of the story she subtly enables the reader to discover that the hopelessness of the addict comes from the addict's own unconscious assumption that only a helpless and foolish person could become addicted to skooma, and that, consequently, no such helpless and foolish person could ever achieve the admittedly difficult task of renouncing, once tasted, the exquisite delights of the skooma. Tilsi Sendos shows that once the addict overcomes the burden of her own self-despising, that there is the possibility of redemption. And against all of society's dearly held beliefs, she says that it is not altogether clear that the addict should renounce the sugar, but that it is only one of the choices that the skooma addict must make. Tilsi Sendos's casual proposition that skooma addiction is not necessarily a sign of moral and personal weakness is essential to her thesis that a cure is possible, but it has not endeared her or her book to the upright and conservative elements of Dunmer society. Okay. Next. I'm my own grandpa. I'm My Own Grandpa, by Gaeldol, the funniest wood elf ever. Why did the dark elf cross the road? How many orcs does it take to light a torch? Depends. Is an orc doing the counting? What is green and hops and sizzles on lava? An orc acrobat. If a wood elf mime falls in a forest, who cares? If you drop a Khajiit head first from a great height, will it land on its feet? Not if you cut off the feet first. Okay. Next, 
Ice and Chitin. Ice and Chitin by Plesius Spatic. The tale dates to the year 855 of the Second Era, after General Talos had taken the name Tiber Septim and begun his conquest of Tamriel. One of his commanding officers, Bisha of Ilios, had been surprised in an ambush while returning from a meeting with the Emperor. She and her personal guard of five soldiers barely escaped and were separated from their army. They fled across the desolate, sleet-painted rocky cliffs by foot. The attack had been so sudden, they had not even the time to don armor or get to their horses. If we can get to the Gorvich Ridge, hollered Lieutenant Escutus, gesturing toward a peak off in the mist, his voice barely discernible over the wind, we can meet the legion you stationed in Pornak. Bisha looked across the craggy landscape through the wind-swept hoary trees and shook her head. Not that way. We'll be struck down before we make it halfway to the mountain. You can see their horses' breath through the trees. She directed her guard toward a ruined old keep on the frozen isthmus of Neron, across the bay from Gorvich Ridge. Jutting out on a promontory of rock, it was like many other abandoned castles in northern Skyrim, remnants of Riemann Cyrodiil's protective shield against the continent of Akavir. As they reached their destination and made a fire, they could hear the army of the war chiefs of Danstrar behind them, making camp on the land southwest, blocking the only escape but the sea. The soldiers assessed the stock of the keep while Bisha looked out to the fog-veiled water through the casements of the ruin. She threw a stone, watching it skip across the ice trailing puffs of mist before it disappeared with a splash into a crack in the surface. No food or weaponry to be found, Commander, Lieutenant Escutus reported. There's a pile of armor in storage, but it's definitely taken on the elements over the years. I don't know if it's salvageable at all. We won't last long here. Bisha replied. The Nords know that we'll be vulnerable when night falls, and this old rock won't hold them off. If there's anything in the keep we can use, find it. We have to make it across the ice floe to the ridge. After a few minutes of searching and matching pieces, the guards presented two very grimy, scuffed, and cracked suits of chitin armor. Even the least proud of the adventurers and pirates who had looted the castle over the years had thought the shells of chitin beneath their notice. The soldiers did not dare to clean them. The dust looked to be the only adhesive holding them together. They won't offer us much protection, just slow us down, grimaced Escutus. If we run across the ice as soon as it gets dark, anyone who can plan and execute an ambush like the war chiefs of Danstar will be expecting that. We need to move quickly, now, before they're any closer. Bisha drew a map of the bay in the dust, and then a semicircular path across the water an arc stretching from the castle to the Gorvik Ridge. The men should go the long way across the bay like so. The ice is thick there a ways from the shoreline, and there are a lot of rocks for cover. You're not staying behind to hold the castle. Of course not. Bisha shook her head and drew a straight line from the castle to the closest shore across the bay. I'll take one of the chitin suits and try to cross the water here. If you don't see or hear from me when you've made it to land, don't wait just get to Pornak. Lieutenant Escutus tried to dissuade his commander, but he knew that she would never order one of her men to perform the suicidal act of diversion, that all would die before they reached Gorvik Ridge if the warlord's army was not distracted. He could find only one way to honor his duty to protect his commanding officer. It was not easy convincing Commander Bisha that he should accompany her, but at last she relented. The sun hung low but still cast a diffused glow, illuminating the snow with a ghostly light, when the five men and one woman slipped through the boulders beneath the castle to the water's frozen edge. Bisha and Escutus moved carefully and precisely, painfully aware of each dull crunch of chitin against stone. At their commander's signal, the four unarmored men dashed towards the north across the ice. When her men had reached the first fragment of cover, a spiral of stone jutting a few yards from the base of the promontory, Bisha turned to listen for the sound of the army above. Nothing but silence. They were still unseen. Ascutus nodded, his eyes through the helm showing no fear. The commander and her lieutenant stepped onto the ice and began to run. When Bisha had surveyed the bay from the castle ramparts, the crossing closest to shore had seemed like a vast, featureless plain of white. 
Now that she was down on the ice, it was even more flat and stark. The sheet of mist rose only up to their ankles, but it billowed up at their approach like the hand of nature itself was pointing out their presence to their enemies. They were utterly exposed. It came almost as a relief when Bisha heard one of the war chief's scouts whistle a signal to his masters. They didn't have to turn around to see if the army was coming. The sound of galloping hoofs and the crash of trees giving way was very clear over the whistling wind. Bisha wished she could risk a glance to the north to see if her men were hidden from view, but she didn't dare. She could hear Ascutus running to her right, keeping pace, breathing hard. He was used to wearing heavier armor, but the chitin joints were so brittle and tight from years of disuse, it was all he could do to bend them. The rocky shore to the ridge still looked an eternity away when Bisha felt and heard the first volley of arrows. Most struck the ice at their feet with sharp cracking sounds, but a few nearly found home, ricocheting off their backs. She silently offered a prayer of thanks to whatever anonymous shellsmith, now long dead, had crafted the armor. They continued to run, as the first rain of arrows was quickly followed by a second and a third. Thanks, Stendar, Ascutus gasped. If there was only leather in the keep, we'd be pierced through and through. Now if only it weren't so rigid. Bisha felt her own armor joints begin to set, her knees and hips finding more and more resistance with every step. There could be no denying it. They were drawing closer toward the shore, but they were running much more slowly. She heard the first dreadful galloping crunch of the army charging across the flow toward them. The riders were cautious on the slippery ice, not driving their horses at full speed, but Bisha knew that they would be upon the two of them soon. The old kite and armor could withstand the bite of a few arrows, but not a lance driven with the force of a galloping horse. The only great unknown was time. The thunder of beating hooves was deafening behind them when Ascutus and Bisha reached the edge of the shore. The giant jagged stones that strung around the beach blockaded the approach. Beneath their feet, the ice sighed and crackled. They could not stand still, run forward, nor run back. Straining against the tired metal in the armor joints, they took two bounds forward and flew at the boulders. The first landing on the ice sounded an explosive crack. When they rose for the final jump, it was on a wave of water so cold it felt like fire through the thin armor. Ascutus's right hand found purchase in a deep fissure. Bisha gripped with both hands, but her boulder was slick with frost. Faces pressed to the stone, they could not turn to face the army behind them. But they heard the ice splintering, and the soldiers cry out in terror for just an instant. Then there was no sound but the whining of the wind and the purring lap of the water. A moment later, there were footsteps on the cliff above. The four guardsmen had crossed the bay. There were two to pull Bisha up from the face of the boulder and another two for Ascutus. They strained and swore at the weight, but finally they had their commander and her lieutenant safely on the edge of Gorvik Ridge. By Mara, that's heavy for light armor. Yes, smiled Bisha wearily looking back over the empty, broken ice flow, the cracks radiating from the parallel paths she and Ascutus had run. But sometimes that's good. Okay. Heavy, light armor. Got it. All right, next reading is the Battle of Molag Baran. The Battle of Molag Baran. Dunmer Traditional Ballad Did you come to hide from war, or come to herd the Gwar, or were you with the house guard at the Battle of Molag Baran? For I was there, and fought and cried, and tasted blood and thunder. I stood in line with mace and shield, as Dunmer clan slew Dunmer. The guard of house Retharan were bright arrayed for battle, they came in pride in columns wide, but ran like frightened cattle. We stood our ground on Tadris banks, then turned their flanks and roweled them. The field was bright with cousin's blood, spilled by doughty Drenim. We lost some gallant gentlemen from ranks of brave house Drenim, and many a wandering widow weeps on the hills of Molag Baran. 
Some fell for wrong, some fell for right, all for the colors wherein, and many bade the world good night at the Battle of Molag Baran. Seeing as that is a ballad, I believe that was meant to be sung, but you're not going to get that from me. And now lastly from this chest, Vampires of Vardenfell, Volume 2. Vampires of Vardenfell, Volume 2. Excerpts. In the West, a shadowy fraternity of vampire hunters is believed to be primarily composed of formerly afflicted vampires who have been cured of the disease. According to legend, the vampire hunters refuse to reveal the cure to the disease for fear that it may encourage depraved thrill-seekers from deliberately infecting themselves. In the East, the Western tradition of vampire hunters is unknown. Vampirism is known to be incurable, and even if it were curable, a cured vampire would be an abomination to be destroyed. Since the disease is infallibly cured if treated within three days, failure to treat oneself after an encounter with a vampire would be considered a deliberate attempt to contract the disease, and a mark of monstrous depravity. In temple doctrine, one ancient tradition holds that among his many other crimes, Molag Bal, the father of monsters, spawned the first vampire upon the corpse of a defeated foe. Several different versions of this story exist, with the foe variously identified as a Daedra Lord, a Temple Saint, or a powerful beast creature. This account of the origin of vampirism is peculiar to Morrowind, appearing nowhere else in Imperial lore. Unfortunately, scholarly inquiry upon this topic is discouraged by the Temple, which controls access to the only substantial collection of historical and cultural records in Morrowind. Though the Dunmer believe the disease is incurable, a buoyant armager of former years named Galar Rithari insisted that he was cured of vampirism. Initially imprisoned by the temple for heresy, he later recanted, was released, and served his final years as a librarian in the Hall of Wisdom in Vivek. It is interesting that previous to his imprisonment for heresy, Rithari had been posted to the buoyant armager garrison at Bal Ur a pilgrimage site known as the Birthplace of Molag Bal. Could it be another temple cover-up? Hmm. And Fetter is going to keep those books on his person because they will all be sold eventually. No need to put them back and How fair they go get them again and all that. Now to the Mages Guild. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. Hail, friend. How delightful. Because there's a book in here. There it is. Halgird's Tale. Halgird's Tale by Tavi Dromeo. I think the greatest warrior who ever lived had to be Vilas Nominus, offered Ziomara. Name one other warrior who conquered more territory. Tiber Septim, obviously, said Halgard. He wasn't a warrior, he was an administrator, a politician, said Garaz. And besides, acreage conquered can't be final means of determining the best warrior. How about skill with a blade? There are other weapons than blades, objected Ziomara. Why not skill with an axe or a bow? Who was the greatest master of all weaponry? I can't think of one greatest master of all weaponry, said Halgard. Balaxes of Aegea Nero in Black Marsh was the greatest wielder of a lance. Ernsi Lervu of the Ashlands is the greatest master of the club I've ever seen. The greatest master of the katana is probably an Akaviri warlord we've never heard of. As far as archery goes, Pelinal Whitestrake supposedly conquered all of Tamriel by himself, interrupted Ziamara. That was before the first era, said Garaz. It's probably mostly myth. But there are all sorts of great warriors of the modern eras. The Cameron Usurper. The unknown hero who brought together the Staff of Chaos and defeated Jagar Tharn. We can't declare an unknown champion as the greatest warrior. What about Nandor Bered, the Empress Katariah's champion, suggested Ziamara. They said he could use any weapon ever invented. But what happened to him, 
smiled Garaz. He was drowned in the sea of ghosts because he couldn't get his armor off. Call me overly particular, but I think the greatest warrior in the world should know how to take armor off. It's kind of hard to judge ability to wear armor as a skill, said Ziamara. Either you have basic functionality in a suit of armor, or you don't. That's not true, said Holgerd. There are masters in that as well. People who can do things while wearing armor better than we can out of armor. Have you ever heard of Halu Passeroth, the king's great-grandfather? Ziomara and Garaz admitted that they had not. This was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and Passeroth was the ruler of a great estate which he had won by right of being the greatest warrior in the land. It's been said, and truly, that much of the house's current power is based on Passeroth's earnings as a warrior. Every week he held games at his castle, pitting his skill against the champions of the neighboring estates, and every week he won something. His great skill wasn't in the use of weaponry, though he was decent enough with an axe and a longsword, but in his ability to move quickly and with great agility wearing a full suit of heavy mail. There were some who said that he moved faster while wearing armor than he did out of it. Some months before this story begins, he had won the daughter of one of his neighbors, a beautiful creature named Mina, who he had made his wife. He loved her very much, but he was intensely jealous, and with good reason. She wasn't very pleased with his husbandly skills, and the only reason Mina never strayed was because Passeroth kept a close eye on her. She was, to put it kindly, naturally amorous and resentful of her position as a prize. Wherever he went, he always brought her with him. At the games, she was placed in a special box so that he could see her even while he competed. But his real competition, though he didn't know it, was from a handsome young armorer he had also won at one of his competitions. Mina had noticed him, and the armorer, whose name was Terran, had certainly noticed her. This has all the makings of a dirty joke, Halgard, said Ziamara with a smile. I swear that it's entirely true, said Halgard. The problem facing the lovers was, of course, that they could never be alone. Perhaps because of this, it became a burning obsession to both of them. Taran decided that the best time for them to consummate their love was during the games. Mina feigned illness so she didn't have to stay in the box, but Passeroth visited the sick room every few minutes between fights, so Taran and Mina could never get together. The sound of Passeroth's armor clunking up the stairs to visit his sick wife gave Taran the idea. He crafted his lord a new suit of armor, strong and bright and beautifully decorated. For his purposes, Taran rubbed the leg joints with Luka dust, so the more he sweated and the more he moved them, the more they'd stick together. After a little while, Taran figured, Passeroth wouldn't be able to walk very quickly and wouldn't have enough time in between fights to visit his wife. But just in case, Taran also added bells to the legs which rung loudly when they moved, so the couple would be able to hear him coming in plenty of time. When the games commenced the following week, Mina feigned illness again, and Taran presented his lord with the new armor. Passeroth was delighted with it, as Taran hoped he would be, and donned it for his first fight. Taran then stole upstairs to Mina's bedchamber. All was silent outside as the two began to make love. Suddenly, Mina noticed a peculiar expression on Taran's face, and before she had a chance to ask him about it, his head fell off at the neck. Passeroth was standing behind him with his axe in hand. How did he get upstairs so quickly with his leg joints gummed up? And didn't they hear the bells ringing? Asked Graz. Well, you see, when Passeroth realized he couldn't walk on his legs very quickly, he walked on his hands. I don't believe it, laughed Ziamara. What happened next? Asked Graz. Did Passeroth kill Mina also? No one knows exactly what happened next, said Halgard. Passeroth didn't return for the next game, nor for the next. Finally, at the fourth game, he returned to fight, and Mina appeared in the box to watch. She didn't appear to be sick anymore. In fact, she was smiling and had a light flush to her face. They did it? cried Ziamara. I don't have all the salacious details, except that after the battle, it took ten squires thirteen hours to get Passeroth's armor off because of all the Luka dust mixed with sweat. I don't understand. You mean, he didn't take his armor off when they... But how? Like I said, replied Halgard, this is a story about someone who was more agile and accomplished in his armor than out of it. 
Now that's skill, said Garaz. Indeed it is. And now Fetter's got to head back to Vivek. I am going to cast Torchlight. There we go. That's nice. So we'll get back there by way of Guild Guide. There we are. With pleasure. Please, go ahead. I'm all ears. Okay. There's a book down here we want to read. Yes. A Game at Dinner. A Game at Dinner by an Anonymous Spy. Forward from the publisher. The history behind this letter is almost as interesting and dark as the story it tells. The original letter to the mysterious Downain was copied and began circulating around the ashlands of Vardenfell a few months ago. In time, a print found its way to the mainland and Prince Lalu Helseth's palace outside Almalexia. While the reader may conclude after reading this letter that the prince would be furious about such a work, impugning his highness with great malevolence, quite the reverse was true. The prince and his mother, Queen Berenziah, had it privately printed into bound copies and sent to libraries and booksellers throughout Morrowind. As a matter of record, the prince and the queen have not officially stated whether the letter is a work of pure imagination or based on an actual occurrence. The House Drez has publicly denounced the work, and indeed, no one named Downain, despite the suggestions in the letter, has ever been linked to the house. We leave the reader to interpret the letter as he or she believes. Neris Gan, Publisher Dark Liege Downain You asked for a detailed description of my experience last night and the reasons for my plea to House Drez for another assignment. I hope I have served you well in my capacity as informant in the court of Prince Helseth, a man who I have stated in many previous reports could teach Molag Ball how to scheme. As you know, I've spent nearly a year now working my way into his inner circle of advisors. He was in need of friendship when he first arrived in Morrowind and eagerly took to me and a few others. Still, he was disinclined to trust any of us, which is perhaps not surprising given his tenuous position in Morrowind society. For your unholiness's recollection, the prince is the eldest son of Baron Zaya, who was once the queen of Morrowind and once the queen of the High Rock Kingdom of Wayrest. At the death of her husband, Prince Helseth's stepfather, King Edwir, there was a power struggle between the prince and Edwir's daughter, the Princess Elisana. Though details of what transpired are imperfect, it is clear that Elisana won the battle and became queen, banishing Helseth and Baron Zaya. Baron Zaya's only other child, Morgaya, had already left court to marry and become queen of the Somerset Isle Kingdom of Firsthold. Baron Zaya and Helseth crossed the continent to return to Morrowind only last year. They were well received by Baron Zaya's uncle, our current king, Athen Lethan, who had taken the throne after Baron Zaya's abdication more than 40 years ago. Baron Zaya made it clear that she had no designs on reclaiming the throne, but merely to retire to her family estates. Helseth, as you know, has lingered in the royal court, and many have whispered that while he lost the throne of Wayrest, he does not intend to lose the throne of Morrowind at Lethan's death. I have kept your unholiness informed of the prince's movements, meetings, and plots, as well as the names and characters of his other advisors. As you may recall, I've often thought that I was not the only spy in Helseth's court. I told you before that a particular Dunmer counselor of Helseth looked like a fellow I had seen in the company of Thuller Saryoni, the archcanon of the Tribunal Temple. Another, a young Nord woman, has been verified to visit the Imperial Fortress in Balmora. Of course, in their cases, they might well have been on Helseth's own business, but I couldn't be certain. I had begun to think myself paranoid as the prince himself when I found myself doubting the sincere loyalty of the prince's chamberlain, Burgess, a Breton who had been in his employ since his days in the court of Wayrest. That is the background on that night, last night. Yesterday morning I received a curt invitation to dine with the prince. Based only on my own paranoia, I dispatched one of my servants, who is a good and loyal servant of the House Drez, to watch the palace and report back anything unusual. Just before dinner, he returned and told me what he had witnessed. 
A man cloaked in rags had been given entrance into the palace and had stayed there for some time. When he left, my servant saw his face beneath the cloak, an alchemist of infamous repute, said to be a leading supplier of exotic poisons. A fine observer, my servant also noticed that the alchemist entered the palace smelling of wickwheat, bittergreen, and something alien and sweet. When he left, he was odorless. He had come to the same conclusion as I did. The prince had procured ingredients to prepare a poison. Bittergreen alone is deadly when eaten raw, but the other ingredients suggested something far deeper. As your unholiness can doubtless imagine, I went to dinner that night prepared for any eventuality. All of Prince Helseth's other counselors were in attendance, and I noticed that all were slightly apprehensive. Of course, I imagined that I was in a nest of spies and all knew of the prince's mysterious meeting. It is just as likely that some knew of the alchemist's visit, while others were simply concerned by the nature of the prince's invitation, and still others merely unconsciously adopted the tense disposition of their fellow, better-informed counselors. The prince, however, was in fine mettle and soon had everyone relaxed and at ease. At nine, we were all ushered into his dining hall where the feast had been laid out. And what a feast! Honeyed gore apples, fragrant stews, roasts in various blood sauces, and every variety of fish and fowl expertly and ostentatiously prepared. Crystal and gold flagons of wine, flynn, shine, and matzah were at our seats to be savored as appropriate with each course. As tantalizing as the aromas were, it occurred to me that in such a maze of spices and flavors, a discreet poison would be undetectable. Throughout the meal, I maintained the illusion of eating the food and drinking the liquor, but I was surreptitious and swallowed nothing. Finally, the plates and food were cleared from the table, and a tureen of a spicy broth was placed in the center of the banquet. The servant who brought it then retired, closing the banquet hall door behind him. It smells divine, my prince, said the Martianess Kolgar, the Nord woman. But I cannot eat another thing. Your highness, I added, feigning a tone of friendliness and slight intoxication. You know that everyone at this table would gladly die to put you on the throne of Morrowind. But is it really necessary that we gorge ourselves to death? The others at the table agreed with appreciative groans. Prince Helseth smiled. I swear by Veronima the Gifter, my dark liege, even you have never seen a smile such as this one. Ironic words. You see, an alchemist visited me today, as some of you already doubtless know. He showed me how to make a marvelous poison and its antidote. A most potent potion, excellent for my purposes. No restoration spell will aid you once you've ingested it. Only the antidote in the terrine will save you from certain death. And what a death from what I've heard. I'm eager to see if the effects are all that the alchemist promised. It should be horribly painful for the afflicted, but quite entertaining. No one said a word. I could feel my heart beating hard in my chest. Your Highness, said Alarat, the Dunmer I suspected of alliance with the temple. Have you poisoned someone at this table? You are very astute, Alarat, said Prince Helseth, looking about the table, eyeing each of his advisors carefully. Little wonder I value your counsel, as indeed I value all in this room. It would be perhaps easiest for me to say who I haven't poisoned. I haven't poisoned any who serve but one master, any whose loyalty to me is sincere. I haven't poisoned any person who wants to see King Helseth on the throne of Morrowind. I haven't poisoned anyone who isn't a spy for the Empire, the Temple, the House of Telvanni, the House of Redoran, the House of Vindaril, the House of Drez. Your Unholiness, he looked directly at me at his last words. I know that in certainty. My face is practiced at keeping my thoughts from showing, but I immediately thought of every secret meeting I've had, every coded message I sent to you and the house, my dark liege. What could he know? What could he, even without knowing, suspect? I felt my heart beating even faster. Was it fear or poison? I couldn't speak, certain as I was that my voice would betray my calm facade. Those loyal to me who wish harm on my enemies may be wondering how can I be certain that the poison has been ingested? Is it possible that the guilty party, or dare I say, parties, were suspicious and merely pretended to eat and drink tonight? Of course. 
but even the craftiest of pretenders would have to raise a glass to his or her lips and put empty forks or spoons in their mouths to play the charade. The food, you see, was not poisoned. The cups and cutlery were. If you did not partake out of fear, you were poisoned just the same, and sadly missed an excellent roast. Sweat beaded on my face, and I turned from the prince so he would not see. My fellow advisors, all of them, were frozen in their seats. From the Martianus Kolgar, white with fear, to Kima Ineba, visibly shaking. From the furrowed, angry brow of Alarat, to the statue-like stare of Burgess. I couldn't help thinking, then, could the prince's entire counselorship be comprised of nothing but spies? Was there any person at the table loyal? And then I thought, what if I were not a spy myself? Would I trust Helseth to know that? No one knows better than his advisors both the depth of the prince's paranoia and the utter implacability of his ambition. If I were not a spy for the Haustres, even then would I be safe? Could a loyalist be poisoned because of a not-so-innocent misjudgment? The others must have been thinking the same, loyalists and spies alike. While my mind whirled, I could hear the prince's voice addressing all assembled. The poison acts quickly. If the antidote is not taken within one minute from now, there will be death at the table. I couldn't decide whether I had been poisoned or not. My stomach ached, but I reminded myself it might have been the result of sitting at a sumptuous banquet and not partaking. My heart shook in my chest, and a bitter taste like trama root stung my lips. Again, was it fear or poison? These are the last words you will hear if you are disloyal to me, said Prince Elseth, still smiling that damned smile as he watched his advisors squirming in their seats. Take the antidote and live. Could I believe him? I thought of what I knew of the prince and his character. Would he kill a self-confessed spy at his court, or would he rather send the vanquished back to his masters? The prince was ruthless, but either possibility was within his manner. Surely the theatricality of this whole dinner was meant to be a presentation to instill fear. What would my ancestors say if I joined them after sitting at a table, eventually dying of poison? What would they say if I took the antidote, confessing my allegiance to you and the House Drez, and was summarily executed? And, I confess, I thought of what you might do to me even after I was dead. I had grown so light-headed and filled with my own thoughts that I didn't see Burgess jump from his seat. I was only suddenly aware that he had the terrine in his hands and was gulping down the liquid within. There were guards all around, though I never noticed them entering. Burgess, said Prince Helseth, still smiling. You have spent some time at Ghost Gate. House Redoran? You didn't know, Burgess laughed sourly. No house? I report to your stepsister, the Queen of Wayrest. I've always been in her employ. By Akatosh, you poisoned me because you thought I was working for some damnable dark elves? You are half right, said the prince. I didn't guess who you were working for, or even that you're a spy. But you're also wrong about me poisoning you. You poisoned yourself when you drank from the tureen. Your unholiness, you don't need to hear how Burgess died. I know that you have seen much over the many, many years of your existence, but you truly don't want to know. I wish I could erase the memory of his agonies from my own mind. The council was dismissed shortly thereafter. I do not know if Prince Helseth knows or suspects that I too am a spy. I do not know how many others that night, last night, were as close as I was from drinking from the tureen before Burgess did. I only know that if the prince does not suspect me now, he will. I cannot win at the games he mastered long ago at the court of Wayrest, and I beg your unholiness, my dark liege Downain, to use your influence in the house Drez and dismiss your loyal servant from this charge. Publisher's Note Of course, the anonymous writer's signature has not been on any reprint of the letter since the original. Oh, that is savage. Okay, we are done here at the Mages Guild. And I don't you can probably guess where we're going next. Ooh. 
We want to go see Joe Basha. And all his books. He is down in the lower waste works. All right, here we are. You flatter me with your attention out there. This is fortunate. How do you go? See, it was, uh, yep, this way. I didn't want to go down this hall and no, that's not right. I have to turn around. Okay. You have our attention, Dunmer. All right. I've got a list of things I'm looking for. And this is one of them. Legions of the Dead. Legions of the Dead. Undead commonly occur in three basic types. Spirit, flesh, and fleshless. Spirit revenants like the Ancestor Ghost, Wraith, and Dwarven Ghost can only be harmed by weapons that are enchanted or made of refined substances such as silver. Ancestor Ghosts, the most common spirit revenant, are harmless, apart from the minor curses they lay upon their victims. Wraiths are similar to ghosts, but they are capable of inflicting wounds to the careless explorer. Dwarven Ghosts are more dangerous still, but they generally only appear in Dwarven ruins. Flesh Revenants, or Zombies as they are often called in the West, are known as Bonewalkers in Morrowind. Magic preserves the Bonewalkers' fleshy remains along with the bones and spirit. Bonewalkers are readily identified by the sharp protuberances of bone and metal employed in the rituals that bind them to this plane. All Bonewalkers are malevolent and dangerous, but the greater Bonewalkers are far worse than the more common, lesser Bonewalkers. Thankfully, Normal weapons harm bone walkers. It is difficult to generalize about fleshless revenants, or skeletons. The agility and fighting ability of the animated remains may depend on the abilities of the revenant's former life, and may therefore be weak or strong, or more or less capable with weapons and shields. Fortunately, enchanted weapons are not needed to destroy skeletons. An exception is the Bone Lord, a peculiar form of revenant that seems to derive its powers more from its spirit energies than from the substance of its skeletal remains. Bone Lords are very powerful and very dangerous. Normal weapons do not affect them. Vampires were believed to be extinct in Morrowind for centuries. Dunmer culture has a special hatred for vampires, and in earlier times the Ordinators and Buoyant Armagers hunted them to extinction. In recent years, however, Vampires have either begun to sneak into Morrowind, or long dormant ones have been awakened. Vampires vary in their substance and power according to their age and accumulated lore, but even the weakest vampire is immeasurably stronger than most other undead. Note, Ash vampires are not vampires, and are not undead. Ash vampires are extremely dangerous. While their spirit and substance may indeed be preserved by some magical process, the holy warriors of the Tribunal Temple report that spell effects known to affect the undead have no effect on ash vampires. Creepy. Praise Vivek. Also creepy. Yes, honored guest. This is what I want to read next, the Arcturian Heresy. The Arcturian Heresy. The Underking, Izmir Kingmaker. With his god destroyed, Wolfharth finds it hard to keep his form. He staggers out of Red Mountain to the battlefield beyond. The world has shaken, and all of Morrowind is made of fire. A strong gale picks up and blows his ashes back to Skyrim. Wolfharth adopts and is adopted by the Nords then. Izmir the Grey Wind, the Storm of Kine. But through Lorcan he lost his national identity. All he wants the Nords for is to kill the Tribunal. He raises a storm, sends in his people, and is driven back by Tribunal forces. The Dunmer are too strong now. Wolfharth goes underground to wait and strengthen and reform his body anew. Oddly enough, it is Almalexia who disturbs his rest, summoning the Underking to fight alongside the Tribunal against Adasum Dir Kamal, the Akaviri demon. Wolfharth disappears after Adasum is defeated, 
and does not return for 300 years. It is the rumbling of the Greybeards that wake him. Though the Empire has crumbled, there are rumors that a Chosen One will come to restore it. This new Emperor will defeat the Elves and rule a united Tamriel. Naturally, Wolfarth thinks he is the figure of prophecy. He goes directly to High Hrothgar to hear the Greybeards speak. When they do, Izmir is blasted to ash again. He is not the Chosen One. It is a warrior youth from High Rock. As the Grey Wind goes to find this boy, he hears the Greybeard's warning. Remember the color of betrayal, King Wolfharth. The Western Reach was at war. Kulikane, the King of Falkreath in West Cyrodiil, was in a bad situation. To make any bid at unifying the Colovian estates, he needed to secure his northern border, where the Nords and Reachmen had been fighting for centuries. He allies with Skyrim at the Battle of Old Raldan. Leading his forces was Shalti Earlybeard. Shalti was from the island kingdom of Alcair in High Rock and would become Tiber Septim, the first emperor of Tamriel. Shalti was a shrewd tactician, and his small band of Colovian troops and Nord berserkers broke the Reachmen line, forcing them back beyond the gates of Old Raldan. A siege seemed impossible, as Shalti could expect no reinforcements from Falkreath. That night, a storm came and visited Jalti's camp. It spoke with him in his tent. At dawn, Jalti went up to the gates, and the storm followed just above his head. Arrows could not penetrate the winds around him. He shouted down the walls of Old Raldan, and his men poured in. After their victory, the Nords called Jalti Talos, or Storm Crown. Kulikane, with his new invincible general, unifies West Cyrodiil in under a year. No one can stand before Shalti's storms. The Underking knows that if Shalti is to become Emperor of Tamriel, he must first capture the Eastern Heartland. Shalti uses them both. He needs Kulikane in the Kalovian Estates, where foreigners are mistrusted. It is obvious why he needs Izmir. They march on the east, the battle mages surrender before their armies, and they take the Citadel. Before Kulikane can be crowned, Shalti secretly murders him and his loyalist contingent. These assassinations are blamed on the enemies of Kulikane, which, for political reasons, are still the Western Reach. Zurin Arctis, the Grand Battle Mage, not the Underking, then crowns Shalti as Tiber Septim, new emperor of all Cyrodiil. After he captures the Imperial throne, Septim finds the initial administration of a fully united Cyrodiil a time-consuming task. He sends the Underking to deal with Imperial expansion into Skyrim and High Rock. Izmir, mindful that it might seem as if Tiber Septim is in two places at once, works behind the scenes. This period of level-headed statesmanship and diplomacy, this sudden silence, heretofore unknown in the roaring tales of Telosian conquest, are explained away later. The assassination story is embroidered. Now it is popularly Talos's own throat that was cut. The human kingdoms are conquered, even Hammerfell, whose capture was figured to be an arduous task. The Underking wants a complete invasion, a chance to battle their foreign wind spirits himself, but Tiber Septim refutes him. He has already made a better plan, one that will seem to legitimize his rule. Cyrodiil supports the losing side of a civil war and are invited in. Finally, the Empire can turn its eyes onto the Elves. The Underking continues to press on Tiber Septim the need to conquer Morrowind. The Emperor is not sure that is a wise idea. He has heard of the Tribunal's power. The Underking wants his vengeance and reminds Tiber Septim that he is fated to conquer the Elves, even the Tribunal. Arctis advises against the move, but Septim covets the Ebony and Morrowind as he sorely needs a source of capital to rebuild Cyrodiil after 400 years of war. The Underking tells him that, with the Tribunal dead, Septim might steal the Tribunal's power and use it against the High Elves, certainly the oldest enemies of Lorcan, predating even the Tribunal. Somerset Isle is the farthest thing from Tiber Septim's mind. Even then, he was planning to send Zern Arctis to the King of Alinor to make peace. The Ebony Need wins out in the end. The Empire invades Morrowind, and the Tribunal give up. When certain conditions of the armistice include not only a policy of non-interference with the Tribunal, 
but also, in the Underking's eyes, a validation of their religious beliefs, Izmir is furious. He abandons the Empire completely. This was the betrayal the Greybeards spoke of. Or so he thinks. Without the Underking's power, all ideas of conquering Tamriel vanish. Would have been nice, Septim thinks, but let's just worry about Cyrodiil and the human nations. Already there is a rebellion in Hammerfell. Pieces of Numidium trickle in, though. Tiber Septim, always fascinated by the dwarves, has Zurin Arctis research this grand artifact. In doing so, Arctis stumbles upon some of the stories of the war at Red Mountain. He discovers the reason the Numidium was made and some of its potential. Most importantly, he learns the Underking's place in the war. But Zurin Arctis was working from incomplete plans. He thinks it is the heart of Lorcan's body that is needed to power the Numidium. While Zurin Arctis is raving about his discovery, the prophecy finally becomes clear to Tiber Septim. This Numidium is what he needs to conquer the world. It is his destiny to have it. He contacts the Underking and says he was right all along. They should kill the Tribunal, and they need to get together and make a plan. While the Underking was away, he realized the true danger of Dagoth Ur. Something must be done. But he needs an army, and his old one is available again. The trap is set. The Underking arrives and is ambushed by Imperial Guards. As he takes them on, Zurin Arctis uses a soul gem on him. With his last breath, the Underking's heart roars a hole through the Battle Mage's chest. In the end, everyone is dead, the Underking has reverted back to Ash, and Tiber Septim strolls in to take the Soul Gem. When the Elder Council arrives, he tells them about the second attempt on his life, this time by his trusted battle mage Zurin Arctis, who was attempting a coup. He has the dead guards celebrated as heroes, even the one who was blasted to Ash. He warns Cyrodiil about the dangers within, but says he has a solution to the dangers without. The Mantella. The Numidium, while not the god Tiber Septim and the Dwemer hoped for, the Underking was not exactly Lorcan, after all. It does the job. After its work on Somerset Isle, a new threat appears. A rotting undead wizard who controls the skies. He blows the Numidium apart, but it pounds him into the ground with its last flailings, leaving only a black splotch. The Mantella falls into the sea, seemingly forever. Meanwhile, Tiber Septim crowns himself the first emperor of Tamriel. He lives until he is 108, the richest man in history. All aspects of his early reign are rewritten. Still, there are conflicting reports of what really happened, and this is why there is such confusion over such questions as, why does Alcair claim to be the birthplace of Talos, while other sources say he came from Atmora? Why does Tiber Septim seem to be a different person after his first roaring conquests? Why does Tiber Septim betray his battle mage? Is the Mantella the heart of the battle mage, or is it the heart of Tiber Septim? Tiber Septim is succeeded by his grandson, Pelagius I. Pelagius is just not of the same caliber. In truth, he's a little nervous with all these provinces. Then an advisor shows up. I was friends with your grandfather, the Underking says. He sent me to help you run the Empire. Well, maybe that's what really happened. Or maybe not. Let's see, next is this. Grasping Fortune. Grasping Fortune by Sergio Hlalu Drombero. I am a counselor of House Hlalu and chose to write this short guide for those who seek to understand us or join us. House Hlalu is the most open and modern of the great houses. We are the only great house who has embraced the irresistible tides of imperial law and custom. And thus we have profited by the Empire's new policies, rising from obscurity as the greatest of the houses. In the great wind of progress, tradition cannot stand. The Redoran may surpass us on the field of battle, but when the dust clears, they will find themselves indebted to us. The Telvanni may know many arcane secrets, but they fight among themselves more than against each other, and they cannot adapt to the ways of the Empire. Ancient and powerful though a Telvanni wizard may be, no individual can withstand the march of history. The Indoril are loved by the people for their gifts and donations, but when the money runs dry, will the people remember? The Drez know how to make money, 
but they have not learned how not to make enemies. Grasp Fortune by the Forelocks. When you see your chances, seize them. When you see a chance to turn a profit, take it, but do not follow money blindly. There is value in reputation, more than many young Hlalu realize. This value must be carefully balanced against the more tangible coins in any deal. Theft and murder are bad for business. You can steal from someone, but will he trade with you after that? You can't bargain with a dead man. There are many ways to do business. In House Lalu, you must be fast and agile. You must be able to keep up with business and with the times. You must be able to speak quickly and convincingly. You must be able to trade with the best of merchants and make a profit. You must learn to protect your own property by securing it with hidden chests, locks, and even traps. And when confrontation is unavoidable, it is best to fight quickly in comfortable light armors with short blades or to fight from a distance with a marksman's weapons. Then, reader, would you seize this opportunity to join House Hlalu? Would you have yourself be counted among the victors in the race for success? Then submit yourself for examination at the Balmora Council Manor. If you have the skills, you will be welcome. And if you have the will, you may serve House Hlalu and advance in the ranks, for above all things, House Hlalu prizes initiative and ambition. The uh, House Hlalu guide, as it were. Let's see. I'm looking for this, actually. Cherim's Heart of Anaquina. Interviews with Tapestrists, Volume 18. Cherim's Heart of Anaquina, by Livilus Paris, professor at the Imperial University. Contemporary with Mac Matt Lusine, interviewed in Volume 17 of this series, is the Kajidi Cherim, whose tapestries have been hailed as masterpieces all over the Empire for nigh on thirty years now. His four factories located throughout elsewhere make reproductions of his work, but his original tapestries command stellar prices. The Emperor himself owns ten Cherim tapestries, and his representatives are currently negotiating the sale of five more. The muted use of color contrasted with the luminous skin tones of Cherim's subjects is a marked contrast with the old style of tapestry. The subjects of his work in recent years have been fabulous tales of the ancient past. The gods meeting to discuss the formation of the world, the Chimer following the prophet Veloth into Morrowind, the wild elves battling Morahouse and his legions at the White Gold Tower. His earliest designs dealt with more contemporary subjects, I had the opportunity to discuss with him one of his first masterpieces, The Heart of Anaquina, at his villa in Orkrest. The Heart of Anaquina presents an historic battle of the Five-Year War between Elsewhere and Valenwood, which raged from 3rd Era 394, or 3rd Era 395, depending on what one considers to be the beginning of the war, until 3rd Era 399. In most fair accounts, the war lasted four years and nine months, but artistic license from the great epic poets added an additional three months to the ordeal. The actual details of the battle itself, as interpreted by Cherim, are explicit. The faces of a hundred and twenty wood elf archers can be differentiated one from the other, each registering fear at the approach of the Kajidi army. Their hauberks catch the dim light of the sun. The menacing shadows of the elsewhere battle cats loom on the hills, every muscle strained, ready to pounce in command. It is not surprising that he got all the details right, because Cherim was in the midst of it, as a Kajidi foot soldier. Every minute part of the Kajidi medium-weight armor can be seen in the soldiers in the foreground. The embroidered edging and striped patterns on the tunics. Each lacquered plate on loose-fitting leather in the elsewhere style. The helmets of cloth and fluted silver. Cherim does not understand the point of plate mail, said Cherim. It is hot, for one, like being both burned and burned alive. Cherim wore it at the insistence of our Nord advisors during the Battle of Zelenin, and Cherim couldn't even turn to see what my fellow Khajiit were doing. Cherim did some sketches for a tapestry of the Battle of Zelenin, but Cherim finds that to make it realistic, the figures came out very mechanical, like iron golems or Dwemer centurions. Knowing our Khajidi commanders, Cherim would not be surprised if giving up the heavy plate was more aesthetic than practical. 
Elsewhere lost the Battle of Zelenin, didn't she? Yes, but Elsewhere won the war, starting at the next battle, the heart of Anaquina, said Cherim with a smile. The tide turned as soon as we Khajiit sent our Nordic advisors back to solitude. We had to get rid of all the heavy armor they brought to us and find enough traditional medium armor our troops felt comfortable wearing. Obviously, the principal advantage of the medium armor was that we could move easily in it, as you can see from the natural stances of the soldiers in the tapestry. Now, if you look at this poor perforated Cathay rod who just keeps battling on in the bottom background, you see the other advantage. It seems strange to say, but one of the best features of medium armor is that an arrow will either deflect completely or pass all the way through. An arrowhead is like a hook, made to stick where it strikes if it doesn't pass through. A soldier in medium armor will find himself with a hole in his body and the bolt on the other side. Our healers can fix such a wound easily if it isn't fatal. But if the arrow still remains in the armor, as it does with heavier armor, the wound will be reopened every time the fellow moves. Unless the Khajiit strips off the armor and pulls out the arrow, which is what we had to do at the Battle of Zelenin. A difficult and time-consuming process in the heat of battle, to say the least. I asked him next, is there a self-portrait in the battle? Yes, Cherim said with another grin. You see the small figure of the Khajiit stealing rings off the dead wood elf? His back is facing you, but he has a brown and orange striped tail like Cherim's. Cherim does not say that all stereotypes about the Khajiit are fair, but Cherim must sometimes acknowledge them. A self-deprecating style in self-portraiture is also evident in the tapestries of Ranulf Hook, the next artist interviewed in Volume 19 of this series. Yeah, there's a whole series about tapestries, I guess. Okay. Right. Next. Yep, this one right here. Words of Clan Mother Anissi. Words of Clan Mother Anissi to her favored daughter. Anissi tells you, You are no longer a mewing kitten, and you have learned to keep secrets from Anissi. And so Anissi tells you, In the beginning there were two littermates, Anur and Fatime. After many phases, Fatime said to Anur, let us wed and make children to share our happiness. And they gave birth to Alkosh, the first cat. And Anur said, Alkosh, we give you time, for what is as fast or as slow as a cat? And they gave birth to Kanarthi, the winds. Kanarthi, to you we give the sky, for what can fly higher than the wind? And they gave birth to Magris, the cat's eye. Magris, to you we give the sun, for what is brighter than the eye of a cat? And they gave birth to Mara, the mother cat. Mara, you are love, for what is more loving than a mother? And they gave birth to Srendar, the runt. Srendar, we give you mercy, for how does a runt survive except by mercy? And many phases passed, and Anur and Fatime were happy. And Anur said, We should have more children to share our happiness. And Fatime agreed. And she gave birth to Hermora, and she gave birth to Hercene, and she gave birth to Maroons, and Mephala, and Sangin, and Shagorath, and many others. And Fatime said, Hermora, you are the tides, for who can say whether the moons predict the tides, or the tides predict the moons? Hercene, you are the hungry cat, for what hunts better than a cat with an empty belly? Maroons, you are the Jacques Khajiit. For what is more destructive than a kitten? Mafala, you are the clan mother. For what is more secretive than the ways of the clan mothers? Sangin, you are the blood cat. For who can control the urges of blood? Shagorath, you are the skooma cat. For what is crazier than a cat on skooma? And Anur said, Two litters is enough, for too many children will steal our happiness. But Kanarthi went to Fatime and said, Fatime, mother, Kanarthi grows lonely so high above the world where not even my brother Alkosh can fly. Fatime took pity on her and tricked Anur to make her pregnant again. And Fatime gave birth to the moons and their motions. And she gave birth to Nerni, the majestic sands and lush forests. And she gave birth to Azura, the dusk and the dawn. And from the beginning, Nerni and Azura fought for their mother's favor. Anur caught Fatime while she was still birthing and he was angry. 
a nurse struck Fatime, and she fled to birth the last of her litter far away in the great darkness. Fatime's children heard what had happened, and they all came to be with her and protect her from a nurse anger. And Fatime gave birth to Lorcaj, the last of her litter, in the great darkness. And the heart of Lorcaj was filled with the great darkness. And when he was born, the great darkness knew its name, and it was Namira. And Fatime knew her time was near. Fatime said, Shakaje, to you Fatime gives the lattice, for what is steadier than the phases of the moons? Your eternal motions will protect us from Anur's anger, and the moons left to take their place in the heavens. And Anur growled and shook the great darkness, but he could not cross the lattice. And Fatime said, Nirni, to you Fatime leaves her greatest gift. You will give birth to many people as Fatime gave birth today. When Nerni saw that Azura had nothing, Nerni left smiling. And all Fatime's children left except Azura. And Fatime said, To you, my favored daughter, Fatime leaves her greatest gift. To you, Fatime leaves her secrets. And Fatime told her favored daughter three things. And Fatime said, When Nerni is filled with her children, Take one of them and change them. Make them the fastest, cleverest, most beautiful people, and call them Khajiit. And Fatime said, The Khajiit must be the best climbers, for if Masser and Secunda fail, they must climb Kinarthi's breath to set the moons back in their courses. And Fatime said, The Khajiit must be the best deceivers, for they must always hide their nature from the children of Anur. And Fatime said, The Khajiit must be the best survivors, for Nerni will be jealous, and she will make the sands harsh and the forests unforgiving, and the Khajiit will always be hungry and at war with Nerni. And with these words, Fatime died. After many phases, Nerni came to Lorkaj and said, Lorkaj, Fatime told me to give birth to many children, but there is no place for them. And Lorkaj said, Lorkaj makes a place for children, and Lorkaj puts you there so you can give birth. But the heart of Lorkaj was filled with the great darkness, and Lorkaj tricked his siblings so that they were forced into this new place with Nerni. And many of Fatime's children escaped and became the stars. And many of Fatime's children died to make Nerni's path stable. And the survivors stayed and punished Lorkaj. The children of Fatime tore out the heart of Lorkaj and hid it deep within Nerni. And they said, We curse you, noisy Lorkaj, to walk Nerni for many phases. But Nerni soon forgave Lorkaj, for Nerni could make children. And she filled herself with children, but cried because her favorite children, the forest people, did not know their shape. And Azura came to her and said, Poor Nerni, stop your tears. Azura makes for you a gift of a new people. Nerni stopped weeping, and Azura spoke the first secret to the moons, and they parted and let Azura pass. And Azura took some forest people who were torn between man and beast, and she placed them in the best deserts and forests on Nerni. And Azura in her wisdom made them of many shapes, one for every purpose. And Azura named them Khajiit, and told them her second secret, and taught them the value of secrets. And Azura bound the new Khajiit to the lunar lattice, as is proper for Nerni's secret defenders. Then Azura spoke the third secret, and the moons shone down on the marshes, and their light became sugar. But Ifer heard the first secret, and snuck in behind Azura. And Ifer could not appreciate secrets, and he told Nerni of Azura's trick. So Nerni made the deserts hot, and the sands biting. And Nerni made the forests wet, and filled with poisons. And Nerni thanked Ifer, and let him change the forest people also. And Ifer did not have Azura's subtle wisdom. So Ifer made the forest people elves always, and never beasts. And Ifer named them Bosmer. And from that moment, they were no longer in the same litter as the Khajiit. And because Ifer had no appreciation for secrets, he shouted the first secret across all the heavens with his last breath so that all of Fatime's children could cross the lattice. But Azura, in her wisdom, closed the ears of angry Anur and noisy Lorkaj so they alone did not hear the word. Oh, the creation myth from the eyes of the Khajiit. Interesting. Let's continue.
Ah, that's what I'm looking for. Progress of Truth. Progress of Truth. Compiled by the Dissident Priests. Excerpt. Concerning the points of temple doctrine challenged by the Dissident Priests. 1. The Divinity of the Tribunal. Temple doctrine claims their apotheosis was miraculously achieved through questing, virtue, knowledge, testing, and battling with evil. Temple doctrine claims their divine powers and immortality are ultimately conferred as a communal judgment by the Dunmer ancestors, including, among others, the good Daedra, the prophet Veloth, and Saint Nerevar. Dissident priests ask whether Dagoth Ur's powers and the tribunal powers might ultimately derive from the same source, Red Mountain. Sources in the Apocrypha suggest that the tribunal relied on profanely enchanted tools to achieve godhead, and that those unholy devices were the ones originally created by the ungodly Dwemer sorcerer Kagranak to create the false construct Numidium. 2. The Purity of the Tribunal the dissident priests say that the temple has always maintained a public face, represented by the hierographa, the priestly writings, and a hidden face, represented by the apocrypha, the hidden writings. The public account portrays the actions of the tribunal in a heroic light, while the hidden writings reveal secrets, untruths, inconsistencies, conflicting accounts, and varying interpretations which hint at darker and less heroic motives and actions of the tribunes. In particular, conflicting accounts of the battle at Red Mountain raise questions about the tribunal's conduct and about the source of their subsequent apotheosis. Also, there is good evidence that the tribunal have been concealing the true nature of the threat posed by Dagoth Ur at Red Mountain, misleading the people about the tribunal's ability to protect Morrowind from Dagoth Ur, and concealing a recent dramatic diminishing of the tribunal's magical powers. 3. Temple Accounts of the Battle of Red Mountain Ashlander tradition does not place the tribunal at Red Mountain, and holds that the Dwemer destroyed themselves, rather than that Nerevar destroyed them. Ashlander tradition further holds that Nerevar left Dagoth Ur guarding the profane secrets of Red Mountain while Nerevar went to confer with the Grand Council, i.e. the tribunal, that Nerevar died at the conference, not of his wounds, according to the Ashlanders, but from treachery, and that subsequently the tribunal confronted a defiant Dagoth Ur within Red Mountain, then drove Dagoth Ur beneath Red Mountain when he would not yield to their will. 4. Veneration of the Daedra, Saints, and Ancestors While challenging the divinity of the tribunal, the dissidents do not challenge the sainthood or heroism of the tribunal. In fact, the dissident priests advocate restoring many of the elements of fundamentalist ancestor worship as practiced by the Ashlanders and by St. Veloth. Exactly how this would work is debated inconclusively within the dissident priests. 5. Denial of the Prophecies of the Incarnate and Persecution of the Nerevarines Though no consensus exists among the dissidents about whether the Nerevarine prophecies are genuine, all agree that the persecution of the Nerevarines is unjust and politically motivated. The dissident priests do not reject mysticism, revelation, or prophecy as part of the religious experience. The dissidents have not resolved the issue of true or false insights. They have studied the mysticism of the Ashlander ancestor cults, in particular the rites of the Ashlander seers and wise women and the prophecies of the incarnate. Many among the dissident priests have come to believe that the Nerevarine prophecies are genuine and have made a systematic study of prophecies recorded in temple archives. 6. Authority of the Archcanon and the Ordinators The dissident priests reject the authority of the Archcanon and the Ordinators. The temple hierarchy has been corrupted by self-interest and politics and no longer acts in the best interests of the temple or its worshippers. The dissident priests believe the archcanon and ordinators speak for themselves, not for the tribunal. 7. The Inquisition and the Use of Terror and Torture by the Ordinators Within the temple hierarchy, it is an open secret that the ordinators rely on abduction, terror, torture, and secret imprisonment to discourage heresy and dissent. The dissident priests feel the ordinators are either out of control or tools used to maintain a corrupt priesthood in power. 8. Fundamentals of Temple Doctrine 
charity for the poor, education for the ignorant, protection for the weak. Though the dissident priests acknowledge that most rank-and-file priests honor the best traditions of the temple, they believe that many priests in higher ranks are interested more in love of authority and luxury than in the welfare of the poor, weak, and ignorant. Curious. Okay, Fetter's gonna head downstairs now. Let's see here. Ah, yes, this ought to be interesting. Nagasta, Kavada, Kavakis. Nagasta, Kavada, Kavakis. An obscure text in the language of the Slode, purportedly written by the second era Western necromancer, Nagasta. Nagasta, Kavada, Kavakis. Nagasta, Kavada, Kavakis. Oxtas so novaj glatero, oix jemail, so ranatau. Ricevas gajin pagintaj membrau kaj aliej individuau. Kujin i menir tusjas so ranata aktivado. En gaji apras informau anuavais pri so lokau so kasaya monataj kunvenau, said nature ank oix pri aliej aktuasaj aktivkau so societo. Nemalafte en oxtas chrome pledge diversa specta materialo edjica oix distra. So in Tereta Cavaco, Retla Terra Kaj Vergiao, Oxtasen of Sanke Alternativaj Kanasu Por Distribui, so Enhevan, so Papera Kvak Vak. Set a lift Sanke, so Enhevao, so Diversaj, Vergiao Antoix Vibel, Nepovas Kajex Nevis, Ziam Oxti Cent Procenti, so Sama. En Malvest Circa Santa Paper Folio Exemple Ebsos Public EG Illustraj Zaun, Kuj Pro Copy Rajtaj, Kiasuna Oxtas Uzeb Soj, and so Interetto. Aleph Sanki so mazeltaj costau reta distribuo fariga so spackagen lima gawan kaj per maxis ply amplexin and haven, porna proli pri kishora actual echo. Tiuj circumstansau rox spagulixos en so aspecto so kvakoa, kuja setir servos onkwinx kil generoso retajo so ranatau. Greetings, I am at your service. You couldn't have just read that for me? Okay. All right, next, over here. Still looking for the next book. That's it, actually. A Less Rude Song. A Less Rude Song by Anonymous. They say the Iliac Bay is the place to barrel around without a bit of apparel on, as advertised in that carol song, a tune that's sung as the west wind blows about it lovely not wearing any clothes. Ladies singing high notes, men singing lows, implying that the most luscious depravity and complete absence of serious gravity can only be found in the water's cavity of Iliac Bay. If you are the type who is more a sinner than a sinned, you'll find it all in Morrowind. But the truth, my child, is that nothing more wild than an ordinary fashion kind of slightly mad passion can be detected, if at all, in Sentinel and Daggerfall. Whatever your odd needs, feathered, scaled, or finned, you'll find it all in Morrowind. It's an invention of bards that Bretons and Redguards have more than some staid fun and suffer deviant fornication. For the most of madness, not the least, the wise debaucher heads out east. Where your once steely reserve is now merely tinned, you'll find it all in Morrowind. In Morrowind, there is sin. But pray, do not confuse Dunmer variety with that found in tepid Western society, compared to which it nearly is piety. It isn't terribly ingenious calling it prudery, observing the dark elf aversion to nudity. After all, the preferred sort of ludity in these parts is far more pernicious. From the Ashlanders to the wettest fishes, you'll find pleasure and pain quite delicious in Morrowind. If you find yourself with unkind kinship with your kin, you'll find it all in Morrowind. I'm sure that was meant to be sung, but I don't sing, so you'll just have to settle for my lack of rhythm. Next up, The Madness of Pelagius. The Madness of Pelagius by Tisathenes. 
The man who would be emperor of all Tamriel was born Thoris Pelagius Septim, a prince of the royal family of Wayrest in 3rd era 119 at the end of the glorious reign of his uncle, Antiochus I. Wayrest had been showered by much preference during the years before Pelagius' birth, for King Magnus was Antiochus's favorite brother. It is hard to say when Pelagius's madness first manifested itself, for, in truth, the first ten years of his life were marked by much insanity in the land itself. When Pelagius was just over a year old, Antiochus died and a daughter, Kintyra, assumed the throne to the acclaim of all. Kintyra II was Pelagius' cousin and an accomplished mystic and sorceress. If she had sufficient means to peer into the future, she would have surely fled the palace. The story of the War of the Red Diamond has been told in many other scholarly journals. But as most historians agree, Kintyra II's reign was usurped by her and Pelagius' cousin Uriel by the power of his mother, Potima, the so-called Wolf Queen of Solitude. The year after her coronation, Kintyra was trapped in Glenpoint and imprisoned in the Imperial dungeons there. All of Tamriel exploded into warfare as Prince Uriel took the throne as Uriel III, and Hyrock, because of the imprisoned Empress's presence there, was the location of some of the bloodiest battles. Pelagius' father, King Magnus, allied himself with his brother Sephyrus against the usurper emperor and brought the wrath of Uriel III and Queen Patima down on Wayrest. Pelagius, his brothers and sisters, and his mother Euthyla fled to the Isle of Balfiera. Euthyla was of the line of Dereni, and her family manse is still located on that ancient isle even to this day. There is thankfully much written record of Pelagius' childhood in Balfiera recorded by nurses and visitors. All who met him described him as a handsome, personable boy, interested in sport, magic, and music. Even assuming diplomats' lack of candor, Pelagius seemed, if anything, a blessing to the future of the Septim dynasty. When Pelagius was eight, Sephyrus slew Uriel III at the Battle of Icadag and proclaimed himself Emperor Sephyrus I. For the next ten years of his reign, Sephyrus battled Potima. Pelagius' first battle was the Siege of Solitude, which ended with Patima's death and the final end of the war. In gratitude, Sephyrus placed Pelagius on the throne of Solitude. As King of Solitude, Pelagius' eccentricities of behavior began to be noticeable. As a favorite nephew of the Emperor, few diplomats to Solitude made critical commentary about Pelagius. For the first two years of his reign, Pelagius was at the very least noted for his alarming shifts in weight. Four months after taking the throne, a diplomat from Ebenhart called Pelagius a hale and hearty soul with a heart so big it widens his waist. Five months after that, the visiting princess of Firsthold wrote to her brother that the kings gripped my hand and it felt like I was being clutched by a skeleton. Pelagius is greatly emaciated indeed. Sephyrus never married and died childless three years after the Siege of Solitude. As the only surviving sibling, Pelagius' father Magnus left the throne of Wayrest and took residence at the imperial city as the Emperor Magnus I. Magnus was elderly and Pelagius was his oldest living child, so the attention of Tamriel focused on solitude. By this time, Pelagius' eccentricities were becoming infamous. There are many legends about his acts as King of Solitude, but few well-documented cases exist. It is known that Pelagius locked the young princes and princesses of Sylvanar in his room with him, only releasing them when an unsigned declaration of war was slipped under the door. When he tore off his clothes during a speech he was giving at a local festival, his advisors apparently decided to watch him more carefully. On the orders of Magnus, Pelagius was married to the beautiful heiress of an ancient dark elf noble family, Cataria Raathim. Nordic kings who marry dark elves seldom improve their popularity. There are two reasons most scholars give for the union. Magnus was trying to cement relations with Ebenhart, where the Raathin clan hailed. Ebenhart's neighbor, Mornhold, had been a historical ally of the empire since the very beginning, and the royal consort of Queen Berenziah had won many battles in the War of the Red Diamond. Ebenhart had a poorly kept secret of aiding Uriel III and Potima. The other reason for the marriage was more personal. Kataraya was as shrewd a diplomat as she was beautiful. If any creature was capable of hiding Pelagius' madness, it was she. On the 8th of Second Seed, 3rd era 145, Magnus I died quietly in his sleep. 
Jolith, Pelagius' sister, took over the throne of Solitude, and Pelagius and Cataria rode to the imperial city to be crowned emperor and empress of Tamriel. It is said that Pelagius fainted when the crown was placed on his head, but Cataria held him up so only those closest to the thrones could see what had happened. Like so many Pelagius stories, this cannot be verified. Pelagius III never truly ruled Tamriel. Cataria and the Elder Council made all the decisions and only tried to keep Pelagius from embarrassing all. Still, stories of Pelagius III's reign exist. It was said that when the Argonian ambassador from Blackrose came to court, Pelagius insisted on speaking in all grunts and squeaks, as that was the Argonian's natural language. It is known that Pelagius was obsessed with cleanliness, and many guests reported waking to the noise of an early morning scrubdown of the imperial palace. The legend of Pelagius while inspecting the servants' work suddenly defecating on the floor to give them something to do is probably apocryphal. When Pelagius began actually biting and attacking visitors to the imperial palace, it was decided to send him to a private asylum. Cataria was proclaimed regent two years after Pelagius took the throne. For the next six years, the emperor stayed in a series of institutions and asylums. Traitors to the empire have many lies to spread about this period. Whispered stories of hideous experiments and tortures performed on Pelagius have almost become accepted as fact. The noble lady Cataria became pregnant shortly after the emperor was sent away, and rumors of infidelity and, even more absurd, conspiracies to keep the sane emperor locked away ran amok. As Cataria proved, her pregnancy came about after a visit to her husband's cell. With no other evidence, as loyal subjects, we are bound to accept the Empress's word on the matter. Her second child, who would reign for many years as Uriel IV, was the child of her union with her consort Lariat, and publicly acknowledged as such. On a warm night in Sun's Dawn, in his 34th year, Pelagius III died after a brief fever in his cell at the Temple of Kinnereth in the Isle of Bethany. Cataria I reigned for another 46 years before passing the scepter onto the only child she had with Pelagius, Cassinder. Pelagius's wild behavior has made him perversely dear to the province of his birth and death. The second of Sun's Dawn, which may or may not be the anniversary of his death, records are not very clear, is celebrated as Mad Pelagius, the time when foolishness of all sorts is encouraged. And so, one of the least desirable emperors in the history of the Septim dynasty has become one of the most famous ones. All right. And this is our next read, Spirit of Nern, God of Mortals. Spirit of Nern. Lorcan is the Spirit of Nern, the God of all mortals. This does not mean all mortals necessarily like him or even know him. Most elves hate him, thinking creation as that act which sundered them from the spirit realm. Most humans revere him, or aspects of him, as the herald of existence. The creation of the mortal plane, the Mundus, Nern, is a source of mental anguish to all living things. All souls know deep down they came originally from somewhere else, and that Nern is a cruel and crucial step to what comes next. What is this next? Some wish to return to the original state, the spirit realm, and that Lorcan is the demon that hinders their way. To them, Nern is a prison, an illusion to escape. Others think that Lorcan created the world as the testing ground for transcendence. To them, the spirit realm was already a prison, that true escape is now finally possible. And up next... Boethia's Glory Boethia's Glory Look upon the face of Boethia and wonder. Raise your arms that Boethia may look on them and bestow a blessing. Know that battle is a blessing. Know that death is an eventuality. Know that you are dust in the eyes of Boethia. Long is the arm of Boethia, and swift is the blade. Deep is the cut, and subtle is the poison. Worship, O faithful. Pray your death is short. Worship, O faithful. Pray your death is quiet. Worship, O faithful, worship the glory that is Boethia. 
into battle strides the Daedra Prince, blade at the ready to cleave the unworthy. It's a shame we don't see more books with art. That looked pretty cool. All right, I'm actually trying to make my way to the last book we're going to be reading right now, and that is oh, Antecedents of... Sweet moon sugar. All right, well, I'm glad you found something you like. Antecedents of Dwemer Law. Antecedents of Dwemer Law. This book is a historical account of the development of Dwemer law and custom from its roots in High Elven culture. In short, so far as I am able to trace the order of development in the customs of the Bosmeri tribes, I believe it to have been in all ways comparable to the growth of Altmeri law. The earlier liability for slaves and animals was mainly confined to surrender, which, as in Somerset Isles, later became compensation. And what does this matter for a study of our laws today? So far as concerns the influence of the Altmeri law upon our own, especially the Altmeri law of master and servant, the evidence of it is to be found in every judgment which has been recorded for the last 500 years. It has been stated already that we still repeat the reasoning of the Altmeri magistrates, empty as it is, to the present day, and I will quickly show how Altmeri custom can be followed into the courts of the Dwemer. In the Laws of Karndar Watch, PD 1180, it is said, if one who is owned by another slays one who owns himself, the owner must pay the associates three fine instruments and the body of the one who is owned. There are many other similar citations, and the same principle is extended even to the case of a centurion by which a man is killed. If, at the common workbench, one is slain by an animunculi, the associates of the slain may disassemble the animunculi and take its parts within thirty days. It is instructive to compare what Dark has mentioned concerning the rude beasts of the Tenmar forests. If a marsh cat was killed by an Argonian, his family were in disgrace till they retaliated by killing the Argonian, or another like it. But further, if a marsh cat was killed by a fall from a tree, his relatives would take their revenge by toppling the tree and shattering its branches and casting them to every part of the forest. <laughs> 